Okay, so we are here. So we're gonna focus on this kind of infinite horizon mark of decision process. And this is the uh, initial state distribution. Right, zero from you. And again, you know, this is the state, average state distribution. It's a mixture distribution over, you know, infinite many time dependent state distribution, right? So starting from this structure, we're gonna consider, I mean, we, we, we started to consider in large scale Markov decision process where P and R are unknown, right? But here we're gonna focus on policy optimization approach. In other words, we're gonna start with a function class pi that contains, you know, all possible policies. So this is a function class where each function in the class is some policy. A policy means that it's a mapping maps from state to actions, right? So maybe, you know, one of the policy looks like to the neural network that takes state as input uh, and outputs, you know, maybe a distribution over actions, right? So maybe I have three actions, you know, this, this neural network takes the state as input and outputs a distribution over action, right? So this is a policy. And a deterministic policy is just a special case of this, where you output a distribution that looks like a delta distribution, right? So you output a distribution that looks like delta distribution and you have zero, zero here, right? So this is a deterministic policy. And you know the policy class could contains all possible two layer neural network, feed forward neural network, for instance, right? All your policy pi could contains all possible, you know, depth 10 decision tree. Right. Basically, you should think about each policy pi as a classifier, right? The feature is X and the labels are the actions. And the policy basically looks at the state and you know, classifies which action you should pick at this state. And note that you know, we're not really gonna assume that the optimal policy pi star is from this policy class pi. All right, so this is really, you know, sort of a realistic assumption because like for large scale MDPs, such as, you know, for instance, Go, like who knows what the optimal global optimal pi star would be? Like, we don't know the optimal strategy for playing this game Go, right? Like for so many years, we believe that, you know, our strategy that we understand is kind of global optimal, but really what AlphaGo tells us, you know, this, what we understand is pretty much just a, some local minima. Like no one understands what pi star is, and no one can ensure that you know a ten layer, uh, a ten layer depth neural network is capable of capture pi star. Like no one knows, right? We just start doing, we just start from some policy class, and we do try and an error, trying to figure out you know, the balance, right? The computation balance and the 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 the, capa the capacity of our policy class, right? So this is hyperparameter tuning. Right, so in other words, you know, for these kind of settings, it's hopeless for us to aim for learning the optimal policy, right? So that's why, you know, from for this lecture and the follow-up policy gradient lectures, we're only going to focus on monotonic improvement, right? So our hope is to find a local optimal solution using, you know, this incremental policy update. Yeah, and from now on, I think we should start thinking everything on stochastic policy. And again, you know, deterministic policy is just a special case of a stochastic policy, right? It's a probability distribution, but it puts probability one or the probability mass on a particular action. That, that's, that's it, right? All right, so that's the setting. And let's recall policy iteration, right? Let me just rewrite things in terms of the the policy search from the policy class perspective. So given the current policy pi t that is computed from the previous iteration, you know, we are trying to find a new policy that actually has large local advantage against pi t under pi t's distribution. So in terms of equation, so this is what, what we tried, what we did in every iteration of approximated policy iteration. Right, so what we did is we approximately solved the following local advantage maximization step. 
So the advantage is against the previous policy, right? Our column policy, pi t. And the distribution that it focuses on is actually the previous policy, pi t's state distribution, right? So that's why we call it local advantage maximization. So this is indeed what we did. What are we trying to solve in the approximate policy iteration framework where we use regression oracle? So we will get to this point in the next slide. Right, so let's call it greedy policy selection, meaning it selects a policy that is greedy with respect to the column policy. You know, with respect to the column policy's advantage function and with respect to the column policy's state distribution. And how to implement such greedy policy selector? You know, one of the approach that we looked at last time is this regression process, right? Let's revisit this regression process. And then let's sum summarize um, this greedy policy selection procedure. All right, so what we did in the regression procedure is that we have a function class that takes state action as input and outputs a scalar. And we use that. In the previous lecture, we used that to approximate the Q function, right? But here, let's just do advantage. So here we are using a function class to approximate the advantage A by T, right? So remember, TSA is Q by T, SA minus V by T, S. Right, but the, the general procedure is the same. Let's sample state action pair, and then let's get an unbiased estimate of the advantage value, and then let's do regression. Right, so nothing is really different. And if if we are given this function class f, you know, I can just implicitly design a policy class where each policy in the policy class is essentially this argmax operator with respect to an a function in the function class f, right? So for each function f in the function class mass call f, I can just design an argmax operator with respect to that function and that gives me a policy, right? So this, this is given, this is implicit, right? So these, the, the, the policy class here is just a conceptual policy class, right? It's not given, it's not explicit. All right, let's just do the usual thing, right? Let's just generate a training data set. So here, the state is generated from the column policy pi t's state distribution. So if you remember the loading process, right? We flip a coin to determine the time step where we loading in to, right? And then we just execute a policy pi t from the beginning all the way to that time step, and we stop and return the state, right? So here, I'm doing a slightly different thing here. You might, some of you probably noticed. I'm just picking action uniformly random, right? And then once I commit to SIAI, I do a rollout to get an unbiased estimate of the advantage value, right? So how to get an unbiased estimate of the advantage value is actually not that trivial, right? Because advantage is the difference between Q and V, right? We talked about how to get Q, but we haven't really talked about how to get unbiased estimate of an advantage. But for now, let's just assume we can get that. Okay, so the simplest thing you can do is just roll out twice if you can re somehow reset the state, right? So if you're at state SI, you can try AI and then roll out pi. And if you can reset back to SI, you just roll out pi again. And the difference between these two trajectories is an unbiased estimate of the advantage. Right? And then just let's just do regression once we get this training data set. Right? So we learned something which we represented as a hat. And hopefully this a hat is approximating a pi t, right? Because yi is the unbiased estimate of a pi t. Right? Because this is unbiased estimate. And then we act greedily with respect to our estimator, right? In other words, we pick a policy that is the argmax operator with respect to the current estimator a hat. So that, that is basically what we did for approximate policy iteration. Except here, I'm doing advantage. In the previous lecture, I'm doing Q function. 
But one thing that I want to emphasize again is Agmax A of A pi S A is equals to Agmax A of Q pi S A. And that, that, that's why we can actually focus on the vantage here, right? Because they're equivalent. Right, so that's what we did in the last week. And now let's just look about, let, let's just put this into the a greedy policy selection procedure. Right, so remember that we talked about, you know, under what conditions regression could be successful, right? So we know that as long as the distribution, the testing distribution is the same as the distribution where you generate the training data, then we're good to go in terms of the regression error, right? So this means that we can expect that under the same distribution, so this is the distribution that we generate data, right? So remember, this is the data set that we generated, right? We're measuring our estimator under the same distribution and because you know the regression target yi, they are unbiased estimate of the advantage of a pi. So we can really guarantee that this square loss under the training distribution is small. Right? We talked about this usually shrinks in the rate of one over n, or sometimes even faster, one over n, depend on the assumptions, depend on the parameterization of your function class, right? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so when we're doing this argument to find a hat, the y i are just estimates, right? They're, yes. We don't have an, okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, estimates, right? But these are unbiased estimate, right. which means that maybe for this example, you have some positive bias. Maybe for the second example, you have negative bias, mm -hmm. right? So eventually, you know, they can cancel out. So okay. you can try out this for linear regression, for instance, right? You will see actually the, the, the noise goes away because these are unbiased estimates. Right. You know, if the not, if this is not an unbiased estimate, meaning that most of the time you just get positive bias, then yes, this regression will not succeed. Right. So in other words, this assumption is pretty important. Great. Thanks. All right. So if we believe that regression is successful, right, and then we can just convert this result into the performance of the greedy policy selection, right? So then we can basically see that pi hat, which is the argmax operator with respect to our estimator a hat, is an approximate greedy policy in the sense of this inequality, right? So here, the left-hand side says that what is the local advantage of pi hat against the column policy pi t, averaged over the column policy state distribution. That's why I call it local advantage, right? And this term is the maximum possible local advantage that you could take, you could achieve, if you, you, know, you search over the entire policy class, right? So, so, so this term is the maximum local advantage that you could achieve. And this term is the regression error delta that we have, right? And remember this delta shrinks in the order of one over square root of n or sometimes one over n. Right, so in other words, you know, if regression is successful, if we have enough data, then the policy that we identified the pi hat is pretty much maximized the local advantage, right? Because if this term approach to zero, then the local advantage achieved by pi hat is almost equal to the maximum possible local advantage that we could achieve, right? The gap is just the regression error. So this means that if you can do regression better, you can be more accurate in terms of, you know, approximating this greedy policy. Right, so this is like the sort of the concept of a reduction in the sense that the performance guarantee from a regression problem is translated to some performance that we care. You know, in this case, it's the quality of the selected policy in terms of maximizing the local advantage, right? The better regression oracle you have, the better regression algorithm you have, you know, this, the better this 
approximate greedy policy. Yes, in terms of maximizing the local advantage. Right, so you can try out, you know, proving this inequality, but it's not super hard. All you need is just translate the guarantee from supervised learning to, to this uh, approximation error here. All right, so it's, it's not super important, so that's why I did not include the proof. But the, the conceptually, you know, this says that the better regression is, the better our greedy policy selection procedure is, right? This, this procedure that based on regression. All right, let's just summarize this a little bit and then we will pause for a second for questions, All right? So what we just showed is that we can do a reduction to supervised learning, specifically here via regression to approximate the advantage under the policy, under the column policies distribution. We can expect it to find an approximated greedy policy optimizer. In other words, the policy that we find pi hat actually achieves approximately maximizes the local advantage. Right, so here I'm using the sign approximation, but you should really remember that you know there's a tiny gap and that the gap is the regression error, which shrinks to zero if you have more training examples. Right, so it's not perfect. Our procedure is not perfect, but you know, if regression is successful, if we have large enough training data, then we should expect that our policy pi hat indeed maximize the local advantage. Right, so indeed, throughout this lecture, we will just simply assume that we can achieve this argmax. Right, so think about an approach to infinite case. Right, I have infinite many training examples. So in this case, you know, I can safely say that I achieve this argmax. I find the policy pi. I find one of the policies that maximize the local advantage, All right? So let's not worry about this approximation error induced by supervised learning in the rest of the lecture, right? Because we wanna focus on policy improvement, but you can easily inject, you know, this approximation error from regression to the bounds that we're gonna show today, right? It's not super hard to do, but for simplicity, let's just assume that we have this greedy policy selector. So we call this, Okay, so that's the first part of today's lecture. And let me actually pause for a second here to see if you have any questions. Uh, professor, can you talk about again, what's the difference between pi t and then the pi in the pi class? I keep getting confused, sorry. Yes, so, mm -hmm. so, so remember the approximate uh, policy iteration algorithm, right? Every iteration, for t equal to zero to infinite, like every iteration we find a policy pi t, right? It's an iterative algorithm in the sense that it finds policy pi t at every iteration. So pi t is a policy that is selected by the algorithm at iteration t. Okay. Right, so this is from iteration t. And what approximated policy iteration is essentially doing is pi t plus one equals to argmax pi from pi expectation of s from d pi t mu right. So approximate policy iteration is essentially every iteration it picks a greedy policy using this greedy policy selector and then repeat the whole process. That's it. If you abstract this regression procedure inside this greedy policy selection procedure. Oh, I see. Okay. Got it. Okay. You have a policy pi t in your hand. And in this iteration, you just search over all policies in the policy class, you know, find the policy that maximizes the local advantage against the current policy pi t. And then you repeat, right? I see. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hey, um, Professor, I have another question. So, what, like, on a high level, what's the difference between this approximate policy iteration and sort of policy iteration? Is it just because that previously we could like do the inverse to find out the you know yeah. the value function for each yeah. step exactly, and now we're just doing um, like neural network to represent that yeah. step? Yeah, correct. Right. So, so in policy iteration, everything is known, right? So we can exactly compute pi s a for all s a, right? And then if you actually know the advantage a pi t, then the greedy policy is obviously the policy that picks the agmax operator, right? Like yeah. max over a t s a. You know, this policy is the policy that actually achieves the maximum possible advantage because it, it, it picks an action that has the maximum advantage at every state, right? But the issue here is that we don't know the advantage a pi t. Like as you see from the previous slides, we have to estimate it, right? Yeah. Like we estimate it by generating training data from this distribution, right? Which means that our estimator is only accurate under this distribution. And beyond this distribution, we have no idea if our estimator is indeed accurate, right? And that is why we can only hope to find a policy that maximizes the local advantage. Local means that it's average over the training distribution. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. And another question is that sort of, you know, given that, you know, we have a lot of computing power today, you can like draw a lot of samples, I assume. And also given sort of, you know, we can use neural network to represent a lot of complex functions. What might right. be like common pitfalls for this kind of um, precision, which seems really good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But one thing you still need to remember is that no, no matter how many data points you can get, no matter how powerful the neural network is, you can still only guarantee that your estimator will be accurate under the same distribution, right? Because beyond the training distribution, like you, don't, you, you really have no control, like what the function, the, the thing that you're trying to approximate it will look like, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So this problem is essentially very severe in reinforcement learning, right? Because remember in reinforcement, learning, you start with zero data. So you have to generate the data from your policy, right? And imagine that you're trying to control a robot walking and you don't know how to control the robot for walking at the very beginning, right? So the data you generated is probably just corresponding to the robot falling down. And no matter how much data you collected, no matter how deep your function approximation is, you're learning a model that corresponding to the robot falling down, right? Not about the robot walking. So that's, that's an issue in reinforcement learning, right? And that's why it is a much harder than supervised learning. Because in supervised learning, if you wanna train a classifier for like classifying cats and dogs, you know, you're just asking people to give you diverse data set, you know, as diverse as possible, then you're good to go, right? But in ARIO, we just don't have data set. Like we have to collect the data set by ourselves. Yeah, so for, for, for the, you know, the working example, if initially you're just learning from like falling down data, then why don't you sort of generate like random controls and hopefully, you know, some of those control will lead to working and then, so you don't, at the very beginning, you don't just see falling down, you also see some sort of working data. Yeah. Yeah, but think about it, think about those tasks, you know, what's the probability of a random sequence of actions could actually make the robot working? The probability might be exponentially small, right? I see. All right. Thank like, you. like think about you know playing video games. What's the probability of a random sequence of actions can actually solve the game? Right. So if you want to commit to a random sequence of actions, yes, eventually you're gonna hit, you know. You're gonna hit a sequence of action that actually solve the game, but the chance is super low, right? Thank you. All right, so that's the first part. And now let's look at the conservative policy iteration. So this will be very similar to the approximate policy iteration algorithm. And we will see a major difference in terms of policy update. So before we jump into the conservative policy iteration, I just want to quickly mention the failure cases for approximate policy iteration. 
right? So here, let's think about the advantage estimation perspective. So this is the same graph that I showed you last week. But here, you know, this green function approximates the advantage of my column policy. And these are my training data. These are SA from d pi t mu. Right, so I train a function. My function looks great under the region where I have tons of training data, but it looks terrible under the, the region where I have very sparse training data points. Right, so now you might learn a policy that actually drives yourself to the region where you don't see that many training examples before. Right, so in other words, you may generate a new policy which generate these red dots, right? Because your function approximator believes that the region where these red dots are actually has high advantage. So you might drive you know, yourself to these regions. So now you get a new advantage function with respect to the column policy, and then you repeat the same process. So you're doing great under this new region where you have tons of training data, but you're doing pretty bad outside of this region because you never see any training example, for instance, right? But in this case, you will actually find a new policy that switch back, a new policy that's gonna generate a bunch of green dots again. And then you can, you know, so on and so forth, you can oscillate between these two procedures without making any improvement. Right, so in other words, we can oscillate between two updates, no monotonic improvement, right? Because the two policy could generate completely different distribution. The estimator that you had from the previous distribution is going to be invalid in the new policies distribution. Right? Remember, your new policy depends on the estimator from the previous iteration. But your, pre your previous estimator is just not accurate under the, the new state distribution that is visiting by the current policy. Right? Like you completely lose control because your estimator could be terrible in the region that your current policy is visiting. Right? So, the key issue is that this approximate policy iteration, it does not guarantee that pi t plus one and pi t will be close to each other. So to solve this problem, the straightforward way that we can do is actually design some policy update procedure that forces the two state distribution to be close to each other. All right, so let's not worry about how we make them close for now, but imagine that we have some constraints that says that Whatever update you do, make sure the new policy is not that far away from the previous, from the previous policy, right? And if that is the case, let's see if we can sort of intuitively reason why we can make improvement, right? And the, the, the two, the powerful two that we're gonna use is again, the performance difference lemma, right? So the performance difference lemma tells us that in order to check if pi t plus one is better than pi t, we just need to look at the advantage against the pi t under the new policy state action distribution, right? So this is action from the new policy, state from the new policy, and this is the advantage of the older policy. But we just need to check if the average advantage is positive under the new policy state action distribution, right? But that's actually the tricky part because like when we doing the update, we don't really know what the next policy pi t plus one will look like, right? In other words, you know, before we committed to pi t plus one, we have no idea what state action distribution from pi t would look like. All we had control is the state action distribution from the current policy pi t, right? Remember, imagine that you know you 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 are in the process of doing a policy update, like you have no control what the next policy would be. Like you have no control what the next exact policy would be, right? So you don't really know the new policy state action distribution. All you have is the current policy state action distribution where you can draw tons of samples, right? But imagine that we can make sure that pi t plus one is approximately equal to pi t. So somehow we can guarantee this. Then we can say that you know, the advantage the new policy has, the local advantage, this is the local advantage that we have been talking about, right? The local advantage of the new policy. Here, local means that averaged over the current policy state distribution, which we have control, right? We can draw lots of samples from this policy because this is a policy that we have at the beginning of this iteration, 
All right, so if the two distribution are the same, then we can basically say that the advantage averaged over the future new policy is actually not that far away from the local advantage, which we have tons of control, right? Because we talked about a procedure that actually maximizes the local advantage, right? This is the greedy policy selector. We know how to select a policy that maximizes the advantage averaged over the current policy's distribution, right? We did this by regression. Right, so if we somehow can ensure the two distribution are similar, then we can translate the local advantage to the advantage averaged over a future new policy. And if local advantage is somehow positive, then we ensure that the policy makes improvement. Right, so that's the reasoning behind you know, this process. And the approximate policy duration is just a motivation for this design, right? Because we know that you know, this is gonna cause disaster in terms of no monotonic improvement. So you can actually literally draw a Markov decision process and show that approximate policy iteration actually just oscillate between two policies and then never make any mistake, All right? So this is not you know, some story that I'm, I'm making up. You can literally draw a special Markov decision process to show that oscillation procedure happens, All right? Okay, so that's the high-level plan. You know, let's design some updated procedure which makes sure this thing happens, right? You know, of course, we don't want the two distribution to be exactly the same because otherwise, you know, it's not gonna make any improvement, right? So we wanna find the balance where we can shoot for a large local advantage while at the same time making sure, you know, the two distribution are not too different from each other, so that the estimator that we have from the previous iteration will actually work under the new distribution. All right, so that's the plan. You know, let's keep that in mind when we look into the algorithm, right? So the algorithm is pretty simple. Let me just show you three lines, right? So this is an iterative algorithm, of course, right? Every iteration we are trying to find a policy by T. The first thing that we do is the same as approximate policy duration. So let's just find the greedy policy that maximizes the local advantage. This is the local advantage. Right? So if you recall the approximate policy duration, the approximate policy duration will stop here. So API, what you do is just set pi t plus one equals to pi prime. Because API says, let's just be greedy. Let's don't worry about distribution shift or whatever. Let's just you know, set the new policy to be the greedy policy. And let's repeat, right? That's a terrible idea, you know, as we have seen already. So what approximate policy iteration does is that instead of setting the new policy to be the older policy, Oh, sorry, instead of setting the new policy to be the greedy policy, it basically do this incremental update, right? So let's do not worry about this termination procedure for now. Let's just focus on step three. All right, so this expression looks complicated, but let me just explain it. So what it does is that, imagine this is our pi t, right? And then approximate policy, this greedy policy selector finds a pi prime. This is from right. So I'm at pi t and I find a target pi prime. So instead of directly jump into pi prime, let's maybe draw a line here and only move along this line a little bit. This is my pi t plus one. So this is all this incremental updated step is doing. So we have some target pi prime. You know, I don't want to commit to that, but let's just move a little bit towards that target. Right? So that's this expression is doing. Right? Let's look at special cases. So when alpha equals to 1, this gets back to approximate policy duration, right? When alpha equal to zero, 
just pi t plus one equals to pi t. So, but this is also, both of the cases are bad idea, right? The first case, you know, we don't guarantee monotonic improvement. Second case, of course, you know, you, you have zero monotonic improvement because you, you have zero improvement because your policies are the same, right? You don't move at all, right? So the first case is too aggressive. The second case is too conservative. Somehow we want to find the right parameter alpha. Right, so another thing you may wonder is how to implement this procedure, right? Again, this is a mixture of two distributions, right? Pi t and pi prime. So the way you do that is that with probability one minus alpha, we sample an action from pi t with probability alpha, we sample action from pi prime. So this is how you're gonna implement it, for instance, right? Just flip a coin, determine which policy you committed to, and then sample action from that. And repeat for every time step. Right? So that is the algorithm. And one step left is this termination criteria. So this termination criteria says that if I reach to a point, pi t, where there's no policy can achieve reasonably large enough advantage, then I should be happy because I'm kind of in a local minimum solution. I'm, I'm kind of in a local optimal solution. But because I'm looking around, there's no policy can actually have positive advantage against myself. Right? So this is kind of local minimum, local optimal solution. So if that happens, we are happy, just terminate. Right, so this kind of says that in policy in gradient descent, this kind of says that you know if we get into a point where the gradient magnitude is tiny, less than some threshold, we just stop, right? Because we know that this is a local minimum solution or it's a global minimum solution if the function is convex. So that's the you know usual analog to the gradient descent algorithm. Right, so the two questions that we want to answer here is that why this is an incremental algorithm, right? And in what sense? Like under what metric? You know, when we talk about incremental similarity, we need to define metric, right? We need to, to define metric in order to talk about two things are similar because otherwise, you know, it's meaningless to talk about similarity. And the second question is that, can we get monotonic improvement for this algorithm? All right, so that's the two questions that we should keep in mind when we jump into the, you know, the analysis for this algorithm. But for now, let's um, pause a second here to see if you have any questions about the algorithm. Um, so let's see. So like pi t, uh, so pi t plus one is made of both pi uh, prime and pi t. So, and uh, does that mean you have to basically keep a copy of every single policy that you make? Yes. So that you can sample like recursively basically. Correct, okay. yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, so this is a downside of this algorithm, right? So that is why this algorithm is not, you know, the most practical ones, but this algorithm has more, this idea of incremental update has motivated many, many successful practical algorithms. Some of which we will cover in the next few lectures. Right, so, so in, some, in other words, you just think about this CPI as a high level, you know, general idea. It's an algorithm design idea. Right, I mean, also in some, in some practical problems, this is not that terrible, right? So you can represent each pi, t, pi prime as a decision tree. All you're maintaining is, is like a, a forest of decision trees. And people do, you know, boosting and uh, random forests a lot in practice, right? But if you start using neural network for each pi prime, then yes, you're gonna probably pay a lot of computation you know, space because you wanna store all of them. Right, so this, like you should really think about this as like you know, a random forest of decision tree, for instance, right? Like each policy pi prime is a decision tree and your pi t is just the example of these trees and you have different probabilities of picking different trees 
So, yeah. So one thing that I'm, I, I think I should mention here is that, you know, you're not really in practice, you know, you're not really gonna implement this algorithm, right? This particular framework that I showed you. But this paper, this paper was around like 20 years ago. And this was one of the most influential paper that motivates tons of practical implementations of you know, policy iteration or incremental policy improvement algorithm. Right. And tons of paper actually uses the derivation. They pretty much copy the derivation in this paper into that paper to show that you know, we achieve monotonic improvement. Right. So some of them we will talk about how to do that. Like what 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 would we do if you know my policy is a parameterized policy by theta? Right. For instance, my pi theta is, is a neural network, right? And the theta is the parameters of the neural network. So we will talk about how to do that. And one way, one, one way you can think about it is that, you know, let's just update the parameter theta, you know, very incrementally, right? So that we ensure this incremental update holds. All right, so that's the second part of today's outline. So now let's jump into the improvement, the monotonic improvement of this approach. All right, so remember we had two questions posed for this algorithm, right? So why this is an incremental policy update and incremental in what sense, right? So let's record the update procedure. So in CPI, we update policy according to this procedure. Right, so pi prime is the greedy policy. It is the output from this greedy policy selector. Right? So draw a picture, here was pi t, here was pi prime. And what I'm doing is moving along this line a little bit. Right, so intuitively that kind of makes sense because you know if pi t plus one is pretty close to pi t, in the sense if my step size is small, then I should expect these two policies are close to each other, right? So indeed you can show that for any state S, the L1 distance, the total variation distance between these two policies at any state is at most two alpha, right? So this is because pi t plus one, S minus pi t, S, what is this, right? So this is negative alpha pi t, S plus alpha pi prime S, right? So if you just add a one norm here, this is less than alpha of the L1 plus alpha the L1 at S prime, right? Which is alpha plus alpha equals to two alpha. Right, so this matches our intuition, right? So if we set alpha to be small in the sense that we move along that line a little bit, then the two policies should be similar to each other in terms of the L1 measure, right? So if you forget about the L1 definition, this is just summation over all actions. And the, the, prop, the absolute value of the difference of the two policies, uh, the, the, prob, the probabilities from two policies. Right, so this is proportional to the total variation distance. So you can basically think about L1 as the total variation distance, right? They're different by a factor two, but it's a constant factor two. Other than that, they are equivalent, All right? So that means that my policies are not that far away from each other. But what about the distribution induced by these two policies, right? Intuitively, we should expect that if the two policies are similar, then the, their distribution should not that be far away, right? After all, in the, in the extreme case, when two policies are the same, the two distributions are the same. So our hope is that, you know, the difference between two distributions, they also just, you know, they differ gracefully when the two policy differs. Okay. So that's indeed this second key observation. So if the two policies are diff are differ by delta at all possible state, then their state distribution, so this is the state distribution, will differ by delta times some ampl amplification, this one over delta amplification. 
So at this stage, you have seen this amplific amplification multiple times, right? So for simulation lemma, we see this one over delta amplification. And for performance difference lemma, we see this one over delta, one over lambda, one over one minus lambda amplification as well, right? So this is really because the policy difference is a one step quantity, right? But here, you know, we're looking at the distribution that averaged over infinite many steps, right? So if you disagree, if the two policy disagree, at every time step, so you will have this compounding error, right? So imagine you roll out two policies, they, they always disagree with each other by delta factor. So then when you roll out, you know, this error disagreement will compound and you will have this one over one minus gamma compounding error. But this still matches our intuition, right? If delta is small, then the difference between two policies are not that big. And in the extreme case, delta is zero, that basically matches our intuition. The two policies distribution should be the same. Right? So I'm not going to go into the details of this proof, but you should check this lemma. And at this point, you should imagine how, how you actually do prove this lemma. Right? So starting from definition, do one step by one step until some point you convince yourself you can apply this you know, recursion step based on the Markovian property. Right? So very similar proof to the simulation lemma and you know, performance difference lemma. I mean, basically, this is the only trick that we have been talking about over and over again right, throughout the semester. Like always start from definition and use the Markovian property, right? Okay, so any questions about these two observations? So basically putting these two together, CPI ensures that incremental update in the sense that the two, policy, two successive policies state distribution is bounded by alpha times this amplification factor one over one minus gamma, right? So this, Totally makes sense, you know, if CPI wants to be very conservative in the sense that setting alpha to be very close to what to, to zero, then yeah, the two policies will not be different from each other in terms of their state, state distribution measured under, under the L1 norm, right? So this update procedure actually makes sense. You know, it gives us some incrementalness in terms of the state distribution. Right? So again, you know, this amplification should not be so surprising, right? Because at the end of the day, this distribution is a distribution averaged over infinite many steps, right? It's not just a one step quantity. So you could disagree with each other, a delta a little bit here, and then two delta a little bit next time step, three delta, so on and so forth, right? So you have this compounding error. All right, so that's the first question. And this is kind of nice because this, this matches our expectation. And now let's look at the second question. So can we get a monotonic improvement? All right, so before we do that, let's, let's just recap, you know, this algorithm, All right? So the first step is greedy policy selector. I'm just picking a policy that maximizes local advantage, All right? The second step says that if this policy is local optimal in the sense that there's no other policy that has positive advantage against the policy pi t, then I'm going to stop, right? So if I look around, there's no policy can achieve positive advantage against me, then I'm kind of the local optimal solution that I will stop. And the last step is that if there exists a policy that has positive advantage against me under my distribution, let me just you know move towards that policy a little bit. That's all CPI you see, right? Let's be conservative. Let's just move a little bit towards that greedy policy, right? So the termination rule is basically saying that there's no policy that can actually maximize the advantage against me under my distribution. So there's no goal that I should move to, right? I'm just gonna stay here and determine it. All right, so let's just say that before termination, can we guarantee you know, monotonic improvement, right? So let me just define this notation, this, you know, this, I don't know how to pronounce it, this A, um, which is the, the current maximum local advantage that I could get, right? So this is maximum local advantage against the pi t. Right? So remember, this is corresponding to this greedy policy selection. 
this is like the maximum local advantage that I could get against the color pass. Right, so by termination criteria, I haven't terminated yet. So this quantity should be larger than epsilon. Right, so this is a threshold that you define, you know, as an algorithm designer. All right, let's see if we can turn this epsilon, this positive epsilon into a quantity that measures the policy improvement. Right? Again, you know, I'm gonna show you like five to six lines, five lines, and you will see that this actually holds in the sense that we can show that if the algorithm is not terminating in this round, it must make improvement, positive improvement. Right? So, yeah. So here's a question, right? Can we translate local advantage to the performance difference, right? And the answer is yes. And of course the tool we're gonna use is performance difference lemma again. All right, so let's just write out the performance difference lemma, right? Again, the performance difference between two policies is the advantage against the older policy averaged over the state and action distribution from the new policy, right? So that's the usual performance difference and this is a pure equality. All right, so now I'm gonna use the definition of pi t plus one, and I skipped a step and I got to this, this specific line, All right? So let's think about why this is true. So again, this line I'm gonna plug in the definition of pi t plus one. Right, so let me just write out this step. Okay, some of you probably have figured out. So the key observation here is that, okay, so let's just use the definition. Right, so sum over a one minus alpha pi t right. So I'm just writing out the definition of pi t plus one. And you should convince yourself that this term equal to zero, right? The advantage against yourself is zero because a pi t s a is q pi s a minus v pi s, right? So if I add expectation of myself, right? This is just V pi S minus V pi S, which is zero, right? Because this says that I'm picking action using my own policy. I mean, of course the advantage against myself is zero, right? I'm not deviating. I'm not, you know, abating my, I'm not, you know, deviating from my, from my own policy, right? So that's the key observation. And then the rest term is just this term, right? So we successfully, you know, massage the equation such that now we get into a place where we can actually look at the advantage, the advantage resulting from the greedy policy selection. All right, so let's move on. So we wanna translate this new distribution to the older distribution, right? Remember the old distribution is the distribution that we have control. We can draw samples, we can draw tons of samples on it, right? We can maximize the advantage averaged over the older distribution. So here, all I'm doing is just add a minus a term where I replace the new distribution by the old distribution, right? So this is just a plus this term and a minus this term immediately, right? And the motivation behind this is that I wanna, I wanna translate from the new state distribution to the older state distribution, which I have full control, all right? So that's the motivation between this plus and a minus. All right, so now this is great because what is this term, right? So this term is the alpha times local advantage 
like alpha times the maximum local advantage. And what about the second term? Right, so I can bound the absolute value of this second term by alpha times max s a a pi t s a times the L1 distance between the two state distribution. Right? Again, I'm using this inequality where for two distributions, the absolute value, the absolute value of the difference between two expectations is bounded by max over x of fx times p minus q under L1 norm, right? So I'm just using this inequality. Now, the reason that I'm trying to do that is because I know that by the design of the algorithm, d pi t plus one is not that different from d pi t, right? So that's why I'm grouping them together. And if I do that, I get this inequality, right? So the first term is still nice because this is alpha times local advantage. And now the second term, after doing this inequality trick, Right, we get into this particular form, which tells us that it, 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 it is measuring the difference between the two distribution, which is a good thing because we know that by the design, CPI tells us that these two distributions should not be different from each other. Right? And from the previous side, we know that d pi t plus one minus mu, oh, sorry, under mu, d pi t under mu, is L1 norm is indeed less than gamma times two alpha over one minus gamma, right? Remember we had an amplification one over one minus gamma from the previous sites. All right, let's just plug it in and finalize the equation. Okay, so here, this A is by definition. It's just, uh, yeah, just a notation in place, right? This is the maximum local advantage. All right, so this is a particularly nice form because we get a quadratic formulation for alpha. All right, so if you plot this curve, this is alpha, this is a value. So the alpha looks like, uh, so alpha looks like something like this, right? So if you tune this alpha or set the alpha to be a particular value, we can guarantee that we can find something positive, right? So in other words, remember alpha is a parameter of our algorithm, right? So we have the power to tune that parameter. So if at this stage, we set alpha equals to this particular number, again, this is maximization of a quadratic function. This is the alpha that I'm gonna set, right? So if I set alpha to be this number, if I set my step size or learning rate to be that specific number, and I plug in it back, this gives me this particular quantity, right? So this is bigger than zero because epsilon advantage A is bigger than zero, right? So what I'm showing you is that by using performance difference lemma and using the fact, so this is just PDL, this step is just by definition of pi t plus one, and this step is just the incrementalness, the nature of the incremental update, and the last step is just tuning the parameter, right? So, you know, we tune parameter in practice, we also tune parameter in theory as well. Right, so we tune the parameter alpha, which is our learning rate. And by setting the learning rate properly, we basically get a lower bound on the policy difference, right? The lower bound is positive. So in other words, we just proved t plus one minus v pi t is bigger than one over one minus gamma times square one minus gamma over eight gamma, which is like eight square over gamma, right, approximately, ignoring constant factor, right? So if the algorithm has not terminated, we know that this A is bigger than epsilon, so this further bigger than epsilon over delta, over gamma. So every round, we're making at least this amount of improvement. It might be tiny, but sure, we are at least not making something worse, right? So that's the guarantee that we could get from CPI.
All right, so let's just summarize. Let's just put these two important pieces together, All right? So the first important observation from CPI is that the update procedure ensures that the two policies state distribution stay close, right? It proportional to the step size, the alpha, right? There's a one over one minus gamma amplification because these two distributions, they are averaged over infinite many steps, right? So you should expect, you know, some amplification. Two, before terminate, we actually guarantee monotonic improvement. So in other words, <clears throat> by setting step size alpha properly, we tune parameter, right? And we can guarantee that the new policy's performance is larger than the older policy by this, at least this factor, epsilon square over gamma. And epsilon is the termination threshold. Right, so this is a very you know pessimistic estimation of the improvement. Right, in practice you could hope you know maybe a better improvement, but this is the improvement that you can guarantee. Like you're never gonna do worse. Right, different from API, you're never gonna oscillate between two policies and not making any improvement. Here, at least I'm guarantee you that you can make monotonic improvement. Right. So the key thing here is that we really sort of trading between this local advantage over the distribution change, right? So if you simplify, you know, the derivation that we had, we can really lower bound the performance difference by two terms, right? So this is the maximum local advantage that we can achieve, right? So if we be greedy, then this term will be maximized because alpha will be equal to one, but the second term might be terrible because the two distribution difference might be very big, right? So on the other extreme case, we can set alpha to be zero in the sense that we are never gonna move, all right? So then the first term will be zero because we're not gonna get any benefit from this greedy policy pi prime, right? Alpha times this maximum local greedy, maximum local advantage will be zero if alpha equal to zero, right? Even though, you know, in this case, the second term will be well behaved, because the two policies are not making any difference, right? So there's really a point that we need to, like we really need to tune this alpha so that we can get the maximum out of this balance, this, this, this trade-off, right? And if we, we move one step further, and this is using this inequality here, so we get to a quadratic function, right? And we love this kind of quadratic function because this tells us something look like that, right? We can pick the alpha that actually maximize this improvement. This is the improvement that we can guarantee, right? So let's just pick an alpha that maximizes this improvement. Let's tune the parameter. All right, so this is really sort of trading between the maximum local advantage from this pi prime against you know, this distribution change. Right? As I said, you know, we don't wanna be too greedy because the two distribution change is gonna be really big. But on the other hand, we don't want to be too conservative because that will forbid us making good progress, right? Like if we just keep staying the same policy, there's no progress we're going to make. All right, so let's just summarize what we covered today. So we talked about this algorithm, conservative policy duration. So the name already says it, right? So let's be conservative. And in words, you know, we can describe this algorithm as follows. Let's just find a local greedy policy using the greedy policy selector. And let's just move towards it a little bit. And how much that little bit is, you have to tune it, all right? So in practice, you tune that step size. In theory, you tune that step size as well, right? So tuning parameters, people, both communities do, right? Theoreticians do and practitioners do as well. And the key observation that we have, you know, one of the key lemma we should actually try to understand is that small change in policies results small change in state distribution. And remember there's an amplification factor still, one over one minus gamma amplification, right? And th the third point is that unlike approximate policy duration, we guarantee that this incremental policy update ensures monotonic improvement.